Uh, so let me first thank the organizers and apologize for not having been able to come earlier than today. Uh, I'm looking for a chalk, white chalk actually. Well, I found it. That's fine. And uh, so yes, I will speak about... Uh, so well, what was the title again? Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, uh, well, let's start with the following, something you've already seen. So, we look on, we're working in RD instead of ZD, right? So that's our basis space. And in RD we pick, to make it simple, lambda, some volume, but to make it simple, let it be a Q. Okay, pick some cube in RD, and uh, on L2 of lambda, so this is where our particles will be living, right? We consider a Schrodinger operator, H sub omega lambda, which is just minus Laplacian plus some potential restricted to lambda. So in mind, I have that I actually have a random potential that's what the omega stands for, living on all of Rd, but I just consider its restriction on some cube within Rd, right? So on Rd, I have H omega, which is minus Laplacian plus V omega. You could consider Zd, right, in the same way. And if you are more comfortable with discrete operators, you can do the same thing with discrete operators. And uh, well, that's a single particle. Right, this is one particle in the box lambda. But of course, as you all know, in nature, particles do not come alone. Right? You cannot, or you can, but it's hard work, isolate a particle, but it's even very difficult if you think of electrons to isolate them. So usually what you should look at is many particles. So you have n copies or n particles. And uh, to make things simple, we assume that these particles, of course, they live in the same space, and we assume that they are identical, right? So in lambda. So the natural Hamiltonian, these particles being identical, would be to do the following, h omega uh, n lambda, which is just the following. You take h omega lambda in the first variable, tensor product one in the other variables, right? Plus, and you do the same thing for all the particles. the one here. Uh, and the one, of course, stands for the identity on L2 lambda, H omega lambda, right? And of course, you have n terms in this sum. And this is the product of n terms, right? And one of the questions is, you can define this. So this is just here you have a differential operator, right? So this gives you another differential operator. In this time, so if this was in RD, so here you have D variables. Here you have a differential operator in N times D variables. And for such a differential operator, well, if you want to define an op a real operator for this, you need to define a domain, right? And, uh, well, when comes the domain, assuming that your particles are identical, right, there are th three standard choices, right? You can assume that essentially they are all the same and si no symmetries, right, which is called, uh, now I don't remember the name of the German physicist. Uh, so no symmetries. no symmetries. Then you have that the particles are symmetric. So this is called the Bose-Einstein 
symmetry and or the Bose symmetry actually. <laughs> Einstein comes up later, this comes from Bose. And particles are anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric. And this is the Fermi, sometimes Dirac, uh, symmetry. What does it mean? It means that if you look at your functions psi, uh, so these are the functions on which you want your operator to act. So they belong to the tensor product of L2 of lambda, which is the same thing as right, or identically can be identified with L2 over lambda to the n, you actually are looking at totally symmetric, or totally symmetric states, which means that H of x sigma is going to be psi, sorry, at H of x sigma is going to be psi at x for any permutation of the particles, n, where x is x1, xn, and x, uh, well, well, let me call it sigma of x. Sigma of x is just x sigma of 1, x sigma of n. Right? So that's the symmetry. The particles in this case are called bosons. Right? That's the Bose symmetry. And the other one is the Fermi symmetry. It's just that uh, psi of sigma of x is minus 1 to the psi. So this is just a signature of psi, of sigma, sorry, signature of sigma times psi of x. And this, of course, also for all <sighs> OK. And the case, so to define an operator properly, right, outside putting boundary conditions on lambda to the n, if you want to consider a physically realistic, a realistic system, you also need to choose which symmetry class you're looking at, right? So I'll be working for, or in the last setting, right? We'll be looking at fermions, looking so at anti-symmetric uh, states. So, and we will, well, Actually, I give different names, where I call it this way. So my Hilbert space, actually the basic Hilbert space I'm looking at, H, N, will be just the, that's the definition of this space, right? L2 of lambda. Yeah, the lambda is uh, actually not very well chosen, but okay, I leave it the way it is, uh, which is just the psi in L2 lambda to the N anti-symmetric. And now, the lambda with the n above it is just a cube. It's just, it's just, yeah, exactly. With the n, so oh, this one. That's the anti-symmetric tensor pro product. So it's just a notation. That's the definition of this symbol. The definition of this symbol is just the size L2 functions over this cube, right, of large dimension that satisfy this anti-symmetry, right? That's the definition. Okay. Now, uh, so what we have now, and uh, well, to make things simple, I will not, uh, I'll consider simple boundary conditions, right? So I need to define an operator. I will do the following. Now I do, I take the domain of the operator. Well, actually, I have to make the domain, and then I take a closure of the operator on this domain. It's just going to be the following. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to consider h omega n lambda on, well, c0 infinity of lambda to the n intersected with h n. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's my domain. And actually the operator i am be looking at, so this is a non-negative operator, right? Actually it's lower bound. Let, let's assume to make things simple, to make things simple, I assume that my v omega is going to be larger than some constant omega almost surely, right? Just to make things simple. 
It's not really less than necessary, but uh, you can do without. But uh, this will simplify the setting a little bit. So you can look at the Friedrichs extension. of h omega n lambda, which will give you, I call it, actually I call it the same name, right? I won't change the name. And you know that it's a lower semi-bounded, and obviously you have the following bound. Uh, sorry, I took minus theta, that's fine. I have the following bound for the Friedrich extension, right? The lowest possible energy for each particle is minus c, so if I add n of them, I get minus c times n. Okay, and what am I interested in? Well, so actually the thing is going to be a Schrodinger operator, right? Because the only thing you're doing, you see here you have a Laplacian in the first in the formula of h omega n of lambda, you have a Laplacian in each variable, plus some potential. The only thing is that for the Laplacian, it doesn't change anything. If you sum uh, Laplacians in each variable, you just get a Laplacian in the total number of variables, right? That's because Laplacian is, has separate variables. But if you do the potential, the potential has a very specific form, right? Because you have potentials that depend on only one set of variables, okay? But it's a Schrodinger operator in the usual sense. What is a bit different is that you consider it on a space which is not the usual space. You're not lo looking at it on L2 of some cube, right? Because you're adding in the symmetry condition. But except for that, you have a standard Schrodinger operator and as such can apply results known for standard Schrodinger operators. Okay? And in particular, right, well, it's easy to see that what you get, okay, so already written here, you have something which is lower semi-bounded, right? The, the lower bound depends on n. Uh, and, uh, well, you can look at the ground state. So let me call, uh, oh yeah, for, for, let me add one thing. So here I have particles, right? They're each living in their channel, okay? But they don't see each other. Because obviously, yeah, maybe I can do the following thing. Uh, and maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to just to change the name of the thing to incorporate a further parameter in my story. I'll put a zero here. You're going to see what the zero, just to see that this is a free operator. So zero, zero, and zero here. Uh, uh, that's fine. Okay, and now, as I said, one of the things one can notice is the following. Take, pick phi uh, j of lambda and e j of lambda. So we are, we are looking h omega lambda is a Schrodinger operator on the cube lambda, right? My potential is supposed to be, let's assume that, I assume that it was lower semi-bounded, let's assume that it is nice and regular, right? Let's say just bounded or, I don't know, continuous or something nice, right? Not too nasty. Then what I know is that I can find, uh, I know that the spectrum actually of, so this be uh, the spectrum of H omega lambda is a pure point, right? You're looking at the Schrodinger operator, on a finite volume, this operator, if the potential is not too nasty, has compact resolvent, okay? So its spectrum is pure point. So these are just the eigenvalues or eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of h omega lambda, right? Of course, they are ordered. So this depends on omega. Let me put an omega here. Increasingly. And, uh, well, they are lower so bounded by minus c. And of course, they tend to infinity uh, when j goes to infinity.
Okay. And the other thing, oh, I'm sorry. E0. Increasing. And the other thing that we know is that, uh, what is that? We know that E0 lambda omega is simple, right? That's the standard result on the reasonable assumptions on B omega. I'll be more specific. Right, the problem in, in its full generality is quite complicated, but uh, I'll be more specific later on about the model I choose. Uh, this is simple, and once you know, so this is the spectral decomposition of H sub omega on lambda. Once you know this, you can easily construct the spectral decomposition. of h omega, where do I put the indices, n, 0, lambda, just by doing the following thing. Well, you define what is called the date, the Slater determinants. So pick j1, jn, uh, in integers, right? So I start at 0, so n to the n such that j1 less than less than jn right so you pick a set an ordered set of integers okay and you can do the following and do it here you can do the following you can do well this what is a slater determinant it's just the following i'll write in the following uh, j1 exterior phi j2 exterior exterior phi jn uh, at the point x, so remember that x is x1, xn. It's nothing but the determinant, so it's one, I normalize it, 1 over square root of n factorial, and the determinant of the matrix phi jk xl j and, sorry, k and l running between 1 and n. Right, and you take this determinant. So I stick with the notations of the previous speaker. Okay. And, uh, well, what you can check easily is that first, this is totally anti symmetric. That's the property of the determinant. Right? And moreover, if you compute h omega n zero lambda. Applied to, I write it in this form, phi j k k going from 1 to n. Well, you obtain that this is the sum for j, or for k, sorry, going from 1 to n of what? Of e j k super omega lambda times the same vector. times this, right? That's the first thing you can check. So these are eigenvectors of this operator on this space. That's the first thing, then property. And the second thing is, if you look at the set of all these anti-symmetric tensor products for J1, Jk, oh, Jn, sorry in n to the n, where j1 less than, less than jn. Well, this is an orthonormal basis of the exterior tensor product of L2 lambda, right? So I leave this as an exercise to the audience. That's an exercise to the audience, but it's a simple computation. Okay, so what's the nice thing here is that, well, we know the complete spectral data of our Hamiltonian, right? So this gives us the complete spectral decomposition of the full Hamiltonian, right? Uh, well, but of course, this is not really what we're interested in because what we see is that all the states 
right? Or the eigenstates of a Hamiltonian are essentially products of one particle states. What does it mean? It means that the particles live along each other without interacting at all, which is not what happens in the real world, right? So, in the real world, particles interact. For example, electrons interact through Coulomb interactions. Actually, if you add the random potential, you should change the Coulomb interactions into something different because there are famous screening effects, right? So the, actually the decay at infinity is not because of the random potential, is not any more one over the distance, right? It's going to be exponentially decaying at infinity, okay? But you should need to add interactions. So therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to add interactions. So pick u, be a function from Rd, and I'm going to assume that the particles, well, what I have in mind is electrons, so that they should repel one another. So I'm going to take an interaction which is non-negative, and the other thing I'm going to assume is that the particles will only be interacting pairwise. Right? It means that if there is an interaction, it's between two particles. Groups of three particles or more particles only interact through the pairs you can form within such a group. Right? There is no interaction attached to the fact that you have three particles rather than to have three times two particles. Okay? So that means the following. It means that I'm looking now, so define. Uh, H, omega, lambda, and you put a U here. No, sorry, this is an N here, and the lambda is here. H, omega, lambda, U. Well, this is just our free operator, plus the sum for all pairs of particles. What does it mean? It means I take I less than J of U, X, I minus X, J. Right, I just add this potential this interaction potential to my operator, okay? So this again gives me a Schrodinger operator, modulo the symmetries, and uh, what I'll be looking at, so I can, let's, this to, let's, let's, to make it simple, let it be continuous and bounded, okay? So obviously if this is a continuous bounded function, uh, this doesn't correspond to Coulomb, right? Because you have the singularity when particles get close to each other. Okay, but nevertheless, start somewhere just to make things simple. I don't want to have to deal with domain problems and stuff like that. Well, then this potential is obviously bounded from below, right? Note that the bound here from below is rather nasty because you have n squared term in here. So if you just do brutally a bound, right? Just lower bound this sum by n n minus 1 over 2, the bound for this one, you get something here which is much larger, potentially, much larger negatively than this operator, right? So, uh, tick, tick, uh, what do I want to say? I have this, uh, and so this defines the h omega n u lambda is, uh, but the fact that this is bounded, okay, will tell you that you can add it, and the Friedrich extension of this will have the same domain as without the potential u. Okay? So this will be given again by, uh, this will again be an, uh, well, is uh, a self adjoint on the domain, the operator domain of h omega n zero. Lambda, right, the domain of the Friedrich's, Friedrich's extension. Uh, and it's lower semi bounded. Okay. okay, so that's just for the setting. And so, what are the questions? What do I want to do with this? Well, so the most simple question you can ask for such models is to understand what the ground state is, right? Of course, if you speak with physicists, what they would really like to know is, well, imagine that you have this operator, right? What happens to it 
as usual with Schrodinger operators, or when you let, when you look at the Schrodinger group associated to this operator at large times. Okay, what's going on? Of course, in this case, if you fix n and lambda, not much interesting is going to happen in some way, because you have an operator which is going to have discrete spectrum for the same reasons H0 had, right? And you're going to have a bunch of oscillating eigenvalues. Of course, they can recombine doing something subtle. But the really interesting thing comes when you actually think of the fact that the sample in real life, even if it's just one cubic centimeter size, because of the number of Avogadro, inside it, you have 10 to the 23 particles, right? Of order 10 to the 23 particles, which means that Lambda actually, effectively, in any real life sample, is going to be sent to infinity. Okay? So, what we are interested in is the thermodynamic limit. So, what is called the thermodynamic limit, which means the limit when the volume of your space goes to infinity. At the same time, the number of particles goes to infinity, and the ratio, which is the density of particles, goes to a limit which is positive. Right? This is what I call thermodynamic limit. For short, I call this oh, such that. Such that, and I call this T arrow. Let it be T arrow, right? When I say in thermodynamic length rho, it means that I have the following thing. And what, so you can do many things. Now you'd like to understand what's happening to this operator when you perform the thermodynamic limit, okay? Of course, the problem, obviously come from here, is that, well, in the limit, there is no real limiting operator, right? You're dealing with infinitely many particles in this infinite volume. So uh, that's something that needs to be dealt with. There is no limiting operator. See, many quantities just will blow up, okay? Or at least uh, it's going to be some work to show that they don't blow up. And so, as it's a rather complicated setting, we're going to ask simple questions, okay? So what are the questions I'll be interested, or I'll be dealing with later on? It's the following. So let me define E u, where it has a number of indices and parameters, n lambda, be the ground state. So it's the lowest possible eigen energy inside your system of h omega lambda, uh, sorry, h omega n. Huh? Okay, and let phi omega n lambda u be the ground state, so, sorry, that's the ground state energy, forgot the energy, and that's the ground state associated or be a ground state because there is actually nothing that guarantees in general that the ground state is going to be unique, right? It's not something because it's mainly coming from the fact that I have these symmetry conditions, right? Think just of this one. Right? Uh, let me think of this one. So, take this, right? And, uh, well, to take the ground state is easy. What you need to do is to take this as small as possible. So, you should take the n first eigenvalues and take the corresponding states. But imagine that the nth eigenvalue comes up with multiplicity 2, right? Then you will get two possible ground states. Okay, so it's perfectly possible, even if this is uh, nice and has, uh, well, not if the spectrum is simple, right? But if the spectrum has multiplicity here, it's perfectly possible that the ground state for this operator, at least for the free one, is going to be multiple. It need not be simple, right? Nevertheless, you can look at what's happening to one ground state, right? The one thing you notice here in this example is that, well, even if the ground state is multiple, 
right? Two ground states should not differ too much because they will differ by a small number. Each of these states here is going to have finite multiplicity, right? And so they should differ by actually a small number of states. Okay, that's one thing you can hope for. You're so actually the ground states, if there are many of them, should not be too different from one another. Okay, that's something we are going to see later on in our model. Okay, so, and uh, well, what's the question now? Well, the basic question we want to understand, or we want to answer, rather say, rather said, is the following. Well, what happens to E u omega n lambda and psi uh, phi, sorry, I call it phi u n comma lambda in the thermodynamic limit, right? How do these things behave in the thermodynamic limit? Of course, you could also be interested in more evolved statements or more evolved questions is if you look at, for example, you look at your system, you let it evolve, so you take it on a cube, right? You let it evolve for a finite time, and you're interested in the result, so you start with some state, right, well-defined. So, for example, I don't know, you take one of the typical questions that physicists would look at is the following. You take the ground state, and you take one particle which is not in the ground state. So you take the ground state and remove one particle, put it in a larger state, okay? Okay, in a higher energy state, not larger, but higher energy state, okay? And now look at the evolution of this, okay, of such a state, after taking the thermodynamic limit. At large time, does this large, this particle that you remove from the ground state, does it decay and go back into the ground state for the infinite size of an infinite volume system, or doesn't it, right? That's one of the typical questions, but that's, as far as I understand, much too hard to solve up to now, right? As you'll see, there are not many results on these systems. The systems are rather complicated, and the study only started recently. So, okay, so there is one case, nevertheless, as we already know everything about the non-interacting case, we can start with looking at what happens when the system is non-interacting, right? Just to get an idea of what can happen. At least we have one system that we can completely solve. So we can start with what happens when, uh, well, actually before doing that, just want to make a, a, a comment. Well, as I'm talking to a probabilistic audience, it's not a problem. So you see here, for the moment, randomness didn't come in, right? I mean, it was just uh, have a general potential. I didn't use randomness at all. But it's going to come up. So... You have used the, uh, used the language that the particles are moving. Mm. Yes. So what does that mean? What does it mean? Well, it means that you can, for example, think of these functions in the case of a random system, right? If you take the free system, these functions, if you part, if you are... Um, uh, if your system is, imagine that it's one-dimensional. We are going to come back to one dimension eventually. Imagine that it's one-dimensional. So the spectrum is localized, right, at any energy. So all of these functions are localized, right? And so you can try to understand, so they have a center of localization. So you can try to understand if they are, these centers of localization, right, if they are moving when you let time evolve. But time is not in here, but time it comes up in the usual way, right? You solve D. Ah, okay. Okay, that's fine. So you can, you can use the Schrodinger equation, right? What I'm solving is, I'm, I'm not interested in the heat equation. I'm really interested in the, actually, uh, but I won't look even at the Schrodinger equation. That's too complicated. I don't know how to do that. But uh, bu 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 uh, times come in, so what is this? This is lambda, so this is uh, u, right? Yes? Okay, and psi, yeah, sure, sure, psi is coming as well. And psi at some time t equals zero is some state psi zero, which of course depends also on n lambda, right? And of course, the limits, 
if you play now and you take the thermodynamic limit here, there is no reason to expect that it's going to commute, right, with taking, with moving time. So this for me means Brownian motion. Sorry? This for me means Brownian motion in the box. Uh, what do you mean Brownian motion in the box? Is it one over I? The yeah, there's one of I. This is not the heat equation. This is, what I say. this is Schrodinger equation. Yeah, there's one over I in front of here, right? Yeah, this is what you meant with Brownian motion. Yeah, okay. No, 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 that's not the heat equation. This is what I underlined, right? I'm really interested in Schrodinger equation evolution. So it won't be relaxing to the ground state, right, if you let it evolve in general. Uh, so, yeah, the one thing I want to do, yes, please. Uh, do you have an equivalent of the green function? The green function in classical. Sure, you have an equivalent for this one. This is just, this, this big thing here is just a standard training operator. So it has a green function in the usual sense. But it's a useful uh, object or, or not? Untractable. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to estimate it in any useful way. Right? It's too, it contains too much information. I don't know how to, uh, to extract the information from this object. It's too complicated. Uh, Right, so I'm, what I'm really going to do, I'll show you. What I'm really going to do is I'm really using, I really study the ground state and states near the ground state. Right, states that have low energy. But dealing with whole green function in this setting, I don't know how to do that. Right? Um, so, but before I, just before doing that, yeah, maybe at this point I've said the problem. So, what I said at first is that there are not many works on this, right? There's uh, well, there a few papers around. Actually, uh, on this problem, depending, so of course there are many parameters that I let free in here. I didn't tell you which, what V omega is, right? So, but I need to mention, so this is the part of what I'm going to talk about, which is less general than that, is uh, joint work with a former student of mine, Nikolai Venyaminov. But there is some other work, right, by uh, Vieri Mastro Pietro, where he considers well, <laughs> in spirit, the same object, right? But for a different V omega. He will, he will replace Rd by, uh, well, Zd, actually Z, if I remember well, right? I'll be replacing Rd by R very soon, okay, to get state results. So he looks at discrete operators, but more importantly, what he is looking at, so here, what I'm looking at is what physicists call zero temperature model, right? Meaning that I don't take into account that particles should be distributed in a special way according to temperature. He looks at positive temperature model. At, uh, positive temperature models. And the second thing is, what is important for him, is that the V omega is not a random model. Well, it's a random model, but it's more precise than that. It's a quasi-periodic potential, right? And um, so typically, right, what he has is that V omega of x is something like, so it's in one dimension of, of n, to specify this, is going to be uh, 2 lambda cosine of alpha n plus uh, omega, right? Where alpha is, uh, what did I do? In uh, 2. Uh, actually, he has some assumptions, right, on diaphantine conditions, right? He needs some diaphantine assumptions on alpha and stuff like that. I don't want to go into de details. But uh, typically, the potential you'll be looking at will be this. And, but more importantly is that from the point of view of quantum statistical mechanics, the way he looks at the problem is a bit different. What he does is instead of looking at just this operator, he looks at the scale of operators in which you incorporate all possible particle numbers. Right? So he looks at the graded, sta the, the, the graded scale of uh, my hn, where n goes from, well, let's say, or zero even, that's just a complex plane, to plus infinity. I don't remember whether he looks at fermions or bosons or actually uh, the, um, 
non-symmetric with no symmetric. On so this is a big Hilbert space, right? To take orthogonal this orthogonal sum. And for each scale, he looks at this operator, right? And what he studies is actually uh, so one, uh, so what do I want? Uh, beta h omega. So you look at the sum of this. So this is for n large. He looks at the operator, right? Minus mu, where mu is some positive constant, which is called, well, I don't remember what it's called. <laughs> uh, the? Yeah, no, no that's, the, that's the model. That's the grand canonical ensemble, but mu has a special name. It's called. Um, I, don't, I don't remember the name, the physical the physicist name for this constant, right? But roughly what it tells you is that setting mu, you change the, you, the so this is h omega n u lambda, right? So he has, so that's a, an, again an operator, right? Which this one is bounded, right? This one is not bounded. Actually, in his case, it is bounded. Okay, it is bounded. And um, oh, what's this constant called now? Uh, well, by setting, roughly, by setting this constant, you set the density of particles, right? This is the parameter that measures the density of particles, meaning my number rho here, right? And what he is studying is actually the ground state. So you consider an operator, let me call it A, L, which depends on many things, okay, on all the parameters. And what he looks at is what is the ground state of this operator on this space. Okay, he looks at the ground state of this operator on this space, and he wants to describe this ground state. Okay. Sorry. Yes, sure. Shouldn't there be an n after the chemical potential? Oh, that's the chemical potential. Thanks very much. Mu times n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. You're right. Definitely. Thanks. Sure. And beta should be a numerator. Uh, I put it in the wrong, let me think, uh, why in the, no, it's, it's fine, I think, if you let, if you send, uh, uh, oh yeah, you're, let me think, if you take the limit beta to zero, you should recover this one, right, so, Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's one over temperature. You're right. Beta is one over temperature. That's true. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I was thinking of one over T, actually. T is the temperature. Yeah, I, I call T beta the temperature. This is what I had in mind. Okay? So if I take T to zero, T to zero right, I get actually my model, right? And of course, everything else is going to be sent off to infinity. And I get just uh, my model at density uh, mu. Uh, sorry. Yes. Why? Why he study this kind of operator? I mean, why he study this kind of exponential form operator rather, rather, rather than the? Well, that's a paradigm of quantum statistical mechanics that is telling you that you have three formalism, right? I don't want to go into uh, statistical mechanics, but you have what I call three formalism for a statistical system. You have this one, which is called the micro. Uh, this is microcanonical, right? But this one does not incorporate temperature, right? Meaning that if I know, if I would know, right, all of these systems for any n, okay, here lambda is fixed, for any n, of course I know this operator. That's the only thing that's coming up in here, okay. right? I know all of this. But what, uh, so that's roughly if you want a definition in physics, there is another way to look at it is rather study this operator, right? That's a given if you want, okay? And to study this operator, uh, should tell you what is happening at a temperature t. Okay? okay? And th there is a third formula a formulation, which is the canonical, oh. which is, but I don't remember uh, how it comes. Yeah, that's grand canonical, but is there canonical? Canonical. Canonical is just the temperature, but you fix the number. Ah, yeah, okay. Okay. So you keep this, you keep n fixed, and you keep just this one. Right? That's the canonical. But I don't, I mean, mathematically, I'm not sure that it was proven that these are equivalent, right? Or in which sense they are equivalent, right? For physicists, there are three ways to look at the same objects, okay? But I'm not sure that there's a mathematical proof of this fact. Classical statistical mechanics, they are. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, so what, uh, so what uh, Mastro Pietro does, he looks at this operator, studies the ground state for this operator, and gives a description of the ground state, uh, actually, of something I'm going to define right now, which is called the, I think, yeah, the two particle density function for the ground state of this operator, right? And that's the next thing I'm going to talk about before actually doing the computation in the free case. So, one of the problems that you have here is that you let n go to infinity, right, the number of particles, and so if your eigenfunctions, you let the number of variables go to infinity, right? And it's going to be, uh, well, if not impossible, at least cumbersome, to study the limit of such function depending on a larger and larger number of variables. So the way you do it is the standard way in probability theory, as you can't study the global function, what you're going to study is its marginals, right? So this is called, in physics, it's called the k-particles, or k-particle density functionals. But these are just the marginals of the projector on the ground state. So what you do actually on any state. So let pick psi n, just keep the track of n, a state in 2 lambda and assume that this one is normalized. Right? Pick a, pick a normalized state. Of course, uh, yeah, it depends on n. Right? And, uh, well, you can look at this state as an operator just by taking the, spec the, the, the orthogonal projector on this state, right? You can take, look at pi of n, right? Take the orthogonal projector on this state. And you can then reduce this operator, so this has a kernel. I identify it with a kernel, so it has x1 xn variables, y1, yn variables. And you can now look at the marginals of this kernel just in the following way. So this is called what is called uh, gamma sub k psi of n. Define uh, when it's just integrate over dxk plus 1 dxn. Of course, you require that n is larger than k plus 1 dy1, dyk, uh, d, sorry, k plus 1, tn of pi n, x1, xn, y1, yn. So it is psi k, psi n, it depends on 2k variables. And of course, it satisfies, it's anti-symmetric in both sets of variables because it was on this side, right? When you integrate this, you keep the same property. You're integrating an operator of rank one, okay? So of course, this thing is only defined almost surely, right, in y1, 1n by the Fubini theorem, for example, okay? But it's going to be a trace class operator. This one was rank one. But this one is just going to be trace class. And one thing I forgot to, to do is uh, normalize it properly. I take uh, n choose k, right? Why do I take n choose k? Because this gives me the normal, the, that's the number of, so if you integrate this, so the one thing is that if I take the trace of gamma k psi n, this is going to give me n choose k, so it's the number of k tuples you can pick among n particles, right? And the second thing, so this is trace class, right? The gamma k psi n is trace class. And the gamma k psi n is non-negative, right? These are the main properties. Okay. And so, that's the one thing I wanted to say before. So, what, uh, so wh when we want to study now, uh, so instead, as I'm not able to study psi to the ground state, or one of the ground state, psi omega n u uh, lambda, 
we are going to study its k particle, gamma k, u, how does it behave or how it behaves in the thermodynamic uh, study? Yeah. We study this, right? You just take the, these marginals and study the marginals in the limit. So here we have a nice a fa a fixed number of particles, right? And we can make sense of this. So the first thing I wanted to do is see what happens if I do it in the free case, right? Without any interactions. So we'll study this. And the other thing is we're going to study, of course, EU omega n. So what happens in the free case? So when u equals 0, there everything is simple because we actually know everything. That's why it's simple. So when u equals 0, as I said, E omega n 0 of lambda, well, we see it here. It is just given by the sum for j going from 0 to n minus 1 of E j omega lambda. I keep the same notations. And these are just the n first eigenvalues of my one particle system. Right? It's just you have one particle in a box with a random potential, and you look at the n first, you look at the n first eigenvalues. So what I'm going to see immediately is that there's no reason why this thing should converge. Right? But what is likely to converge is the intensive quantity, meaning if you renormalize by the number of particles. Right? It's natural to expect that if you increase the size of your system, the energy is going to be increased by the number of particles within your system. OK, so this actually can be computed because we can rewrite this. Or actually, its limit can be computed in a, in a rather general case. We can, uh, well, we can do the following. Introduce, so recall that, uh, or let, uh, let what? Let n sub lambda of e be the counting function. for the eigenvalues of h omega restricted to lambda. What does it mean? It means that n lambda of e is just the number of e j omega lambda less than e. Right? I just take this counting function. So this is uh, well defined okay, for the counting function. And there is another thing that actually, well, another feature of random operators that uh, we know how to control is that if we know that the operator, actually the random operator we're looking at, is ergodic, like it was the case in the talks of Simone Warzer at the beginning of this summer school, right? for example, the Anderson model or continuous Anderson models, well, then one can show, under rather general condition, on the random potential v omega, you can actually show that, oops, it didn't hurt anybody. OK, that's already something. Uh, 1 over the volume of lambda divided by n lambda of e. Well, see, this depends on omega. I forget. Yeah, let me put the omega here. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, well, this converges when lambda goes to infinity, almost surely, to some limit, which is called the integrate density of states. Right? So this is known under fairly general conditions on the operator, both in discrete and the continuous case. 
Uh, well, so this suggests that a way to rewrite, so what I'm study, what I want to study is 1 over n e omega n 0 lambda is equal to 1 over n integral from minus infinity. So this doesn't matter, this doesn't hurt, right, because we are looking at, we are dealing with uh, lower semi-bounded operators. Two energy, uh, two energy what? Two energy E uh, n minus one omega lambda, right? Uh, and here I have E times d n. So I just take the distributional derivative or derivative as a measure of this at E, right? So I'm going to divide this by lambda, multiply this by lambda, right? And how is this defined? E n minus 1 omega lambda, by definition, it is the lowest point where n lambda omega e uh, is equal to n, so if you divide this by lambda, this is divided by n, lambda, right? It's the lowest energy, is the infimum, so let me write it here. E, it's the infimum of E such that you have this, right? <coughs> so, the one thing in your favor is that, well, this measure is non-negative, meaning that this function is non-decreasing, right? So, to make things simple, imagine that the limit this limit is a continuous function. This is also known to be the case in many random systems, right? Not always, right? There are random systems, especially with magnetic fields, where it's not the case. This function can have jumps. But if you don't have magnetic field in many systems with a real symbol, this is known to be continuous. Well, then by Dini theorem, right, you have some uniformity of the convergence, okay, using Dini theorem. And so you can show or expect, you have to show, that E n minus 1 omega lambda converges when in the thermodynamic limit rho to E rho defined by, defined by n of E rho. Well, this converges to rho, we said, is equal to rho. Right? You can expect that actually the solution to this minimization problem converges to the solution of the limit of the minimization problem. And this can be shown under suitable assumptions on the regularity of n, especially if n is continuous. Actually, it's, it's enough to have n continuous. Uh, so that's the first thing. So it tells you, where is my integral? Here. So what you expect now, using the same argument, is that this actually is going to converge to, well, this converges to, so, so this is in the thermodynamic limit row, 1 over rho, in the graph from minus infinity to e rho, e d n of e. Right? So you get that this converges to what I'm going to call e zero. Uh, well, which depends on your rho. You see that this is a non-random number, right, which just depends on the initial random operator, right, on Rd. Okay, so in a way, well, not completely, half of the mission is accomplished in the case, in the free case, because you already got the limit we wanted to compute. Of course, in general, you don't know this number, you don't know this function, right, but you can say a number of things about this function. Okay, and what happens what 
What about, well, to make it simple, the gamma k of psi, uh, what did I call it, zero, omega n lambda. Right? Can we show something of the same kind for the k particle reduced density matrix for the ground state? Okay, what do we know? We know that this thing, well, we know what it is. It's just phi zero uh, omega lambda exterior exterior phi n minus one omega lambda. So we can compute from this, right? From this we can compute gamma, let's say one, just the one particle density matrix. Lambda, okay? And so what is this by definition? Uh, well, it is just, as we said, the integral of a day x1 d... Uh, sorry, I did something... What did I... No, no, no. Uh, uh, here I did something <laughs> which is not uh, correct here. Why did I integrate over all of this? No, that's not what I wanted to do. What I want to do is this, and here I take yk equals x, uh, sorry, yj equals xj for j going from k plus 1 to n. That's going to be better for marginal, right? I project onto all of these, right? I take the y's to be equal to the x's, right? So I project on the diagonal over the k, n minus k last terms, right? What I wrote here was false. Okay, so I, if you want, I can do it, I can write it this way. So it's x1, xk, xk plus 1, xn, comma, y1, yk, xk plus 1, xn. But these have to be taken the same, right? I want to project down onto these. Okay, so here I have dx1, uh, dx2, dxn. And I have what? I have my determinant. Uh, phi j of x k. Uh, yeah, phi j of x k. J running from uh, j k 1 to n. Okay, this determinant. Uh, sorry, and uh, well, these are we can, I can assume that these are real, right? My potential is real. I didn't say that I want something self adjoint, so I don't need to put any bars. And here I have phi j x uh, y one or oh, y k, right? One j k n, right? Where I'm going to write it in here, where y k, sorry, y two equals x two, y n is equal to x n. Right? I take this product. Okay, so this is this at uh, x one y one. Okay, and if you do the computation. So this is left as an exercise, right? You integrate this. If you do the computation, what happens? Well, what you get is that this is just the sum for j going from 0 to n minus 1 of phi j x1 phi j y1, right? So what is it? It's just the orthogonal projector, right? It's the spectral projector on the energies from minus infinity to E n minus 1 omega lambda of my operator on the box, right? It's just a spectral projector on all the states that have energy less than e n minus 1. Okay. 
And one can show that this actually, in the thermodynamic limit row, converges to the spectral projector for the full operator, random operator, on the energies below E rho. Yeah, one thing I didn't say is that is E rho is called the Fermi energy. Okay, one can show this. So, of course, here we're dealing with compact operators, right? So, that's a limit, uh, actually, of, um, sorry, what did I say? Uh, okay, that's the limit of, so this is a trace class operator, right? But the trace of this thing blows up, right? The trace of this thing, I forgot the N here. Okay, need to normalize this by n. Okay, the trace of this thing blows up. This has infinite trace, right? So we have the convergence of two operators. Okay, they are bounded. What you can show is that these operators are bounded. But nevertheless, you need to specify a sense for this convergence, right? So depending on the model, you can show, for example, if the model is regular enough, you can show strong convergence, <coughs> right? Or you can show, show, and this is more, much more general, converges uh, per number, uh, per particle, meaning that you have convergence in the sense 1 over n, the trace of a depending on n minus b n, right? Sorry this goes to zero, right? So you take trace per particle, okay? So this depends on the model you have, what kind of convergence you can show. Excuse me, maybe, maybe uh, yes. I missed something, but I, I, I don't get the interpretation, uh, the probabilistic interpretation of the gamma clip side. Maybe you explain it. Okay. But it's, it's, it's an operator version. If you, if you had, imagine that you take, right, the joint distribution functions of your random variables, okay? To get the marginals, you just integrate out a number of these random variables, right? So here what you have is that you don't have, these are not random variables, these are kernels, right? Kernels of operators. But nevertheless, they have positivity properties. These operators have positivity properties. And what you do is you just take partial traces. Instead of integrating out, I take a partial trace with respect to n minus k particles. And that's another way to see this, right? Taking this integral is just taking partial traces. It's the same thing. If I take an orthonormal basis, well chosen, right, of the n minus k last variables, and I take the trace over this for fixing the k first, take a trace over this, I get exactly this integral. Right, so you, you trace out a fixed number, uh, actually a growing number of variables. Uh, is there an interpretation in terms of the dynamic of the particle of the gamma k of psi n? No, because this is for a fixed state. There is no dynamics here. This is, this is for, if you take, you take a sequence of states, yes. right, with increasing number of particles. Okay, and what you're doing, and what you want to understand is, define a limit for such a sequence of states of number increasing of particles, right? So you could define, in a way, a weak limit by saying that all the, right, finite density matrix will converge. Of course, if they do, there is a compatibility condition that is going to be satisfied. Uh, so, so it must be interpreted as, uh, as a test function. Something. If you want, yeah, it's a, it's a way of testing. It's a, it's a, a notion of weak convergence, right? It's just like, imagine probability theory, you do this the same way. I mean, imagine that you have a family an increasing of increasing size, right, of random variables. You can look at the marginals and you can say that this family of increasing size convergence in the what, whatever sense. Psi means, the psi means that you look at the, the test, you test again a certain function. That the if you want, yeah, you can, you can say this. Yeah, another way to look at it, if you want to look at this operator, you can apply this operator to two vectors by taking a scalar product and it's going to be testing right, plus taking a partial trace. And here it's not, it's, it's not really testing here, right, because you're taking a partial trace, not the same, same thing. It's a, it's a different operation. But this operation corresponds to 
taking marginals in marginals of, of, of and the, and the <laughs> so but really the idea is that or on another way to interpret it imagine now that your state giving rise to this is pure right in the sense that it's exactly of this type right it's just a slater determinant then what you obtain in this case is that you obtain exactly all the k groups or the groups or rather said all the way you can group k particles together this is exactly what's coming out from this computation right okay yes please can you use the log line the, the left side uh -huh. is an operator and a one particle space right? yes and the right side too actually and the very the right it depends on x1 y. oh yeah yeah sure i forgot i forgot to put the so you see that's also an operator this is a projector, that's just a spectral projector yeah. of your random Hamiltonian, right? Yeah. So I, I wrote it as an operator without forgetting about the kernel variables. But you project it over a space of dimension of... No, no, but that's the, what does it mean? This is a function applied to the operator. So you have, have a self-adjoint operator and you take a function of this operator, okay? It's just like a function of a matrix. So what does it, wh oh, okay, so this is, th if you want, you can, if you take, I don't know in which way you, to explain it, but uh, if you take, for example, the spectral resolution, so that's, that's a, if you want, this would be the definition of this, right? That's the definition of this. But you can write it in a different way. If you have a self-adjoint operator H, right? You know that you can actually write H as the integral of lambda, and here you have some spectral valued measure, of some uh, projection valued measure, right? and you integrate lambda. And so what is a function of h? It's just the integral of this function of lambda, d e lambda. Right? My function here is this. Right? So what I'm doing here is I just take integral from minus infinity to e omega, oh, sorry, e well, n minus 1 omega lambda, d e lambda up to, yeah, but yeah I wrote it, sorry. Oh, I start with minus infinity, and I write it here, so it's going to be clearer n minus 1 omega lambda. See, it's the same thing. So, so that's the spectral projection of my random Hamiltonian. Okay? It's the same thing as this. It's just a function of the operator. Right? The projection that you take, that this is a projection. This thing is a function of the operator. Okay? Can I have a question? Sure. So, do you know, do you know this uh, language like determinantal processes? Uh, not very much, but a little bit. Okay, because I think that that should somehow be related very closely to what you're doing, and uh, and you know, like the GeoE eigenvalues, for example. That's a that's a, their distribution is, is a very simple example. Yeah. But it's not. It's well. Uh, <laughs> well, you see. Okay, it's it is. It's not really related to this in the sense that. Of course, this comes up. You see, this, this story is, I start with a single particle model and go up increasing the number of particles and increasing the size of space. The thing you are talking about is actually something which is valid for the single particle model, right? We are looking at just one particle model and its eigenvalues for this model follow a special law, right, as random objects. Here, I, in, in this thing, I actually need, well, almost nothing about this law, right? This is not what I'm studying here. I'm really doing the following thing is I'm, I'm trying to, so this is still in the free case, so it's more or less, it's pretty, it's obvious, it's trivial. All of this is a very simple computation, right? It's just a free case, but it's more a way of an algebra, it's an algebraic procedure, if you want, right? I'm really doing algebra. It's more your marginals. Do you get determinants in there? You had some Slater in there. Uh, yeah, but it's not the same kind of determinants. I, I agree. Of course, they have the same kind of, it's a determinant, there's only one, okay? <laughs> but it's not, it's not determinant in the sense that you're taking determinant of, spe of some special functions that come out in your, random in, your, in your random operator, one particle random operator. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure I answered your question, right? The, but it, it, it really, I think that the, 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 there is a difference in point of view in the sense that here what I'm looking at is I start with one particle, I reproduce it, I take n of them of the same kind, and what I'm interested in is not really this computation because this is, well, 
it's finished, right? This is uh, the case, the free case, nothing else to do. We've got everything, okay? It's what is happening is that if you put many of these particles together, okay, and add some interaction, what can you do then? Okay, and then I don't see why the terminal by process. By itself and by some interaction. Uh, yes and no. Actually, the, the the fact that you're fermionic, of course, there is, there is. You, you have some interaction, but it's not going to change the. If you look at, for example. The gamma k's, the fact that they are fermionic, will not sh change this in the, if you take, if I take the same computation, right, and look at the non-symmetric, not the bosonic. Bosonic is going to be a completely different story because then to get the lowest ground state, as you can put everybody together into the same state, you're going to look at everybody in the ground state. So it's going to get a completely different picture, right? But so in this way, you're right. In this way, there is already some interaction due to the fermions. That, that's correct. And I think, I think if you just take that interaction yes. and nothing else, yes. and no, no, no extra stuff, uh -huh. so says you already get the GUE eigenvalues. Uh, wh wh where do you, I don't understand what you mean with, with the GUE eigenvalues. You just do your, the story that you're doing, you're yes. doing and you maybe use the potential. Well, this is the I don't know exactly. GUE. Um, yeah, but with GUE where? Where do you get the GUE? Well, but, but uh, not even taking the limit, just finite time. Right? So, but what do you, where, where do you, uh, put the uh, positions of particles as eigenvalues. Okay, so, so ah, but that's another story. Okay, sure. No, no, sure. The, the, the eigenvalues is the ground state of the anti-symmetric. Okay. Yeah, okay, but that's a, that's a completely different, it's a reinterpretation of the model. That's not the, the particles I'm interested in. Right? That's not the particles. I mean, the, the position of the eigenvalues are not the particles I'm interested in. That's a, a different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's another story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. The particles I'm interested in are really something which they are living in Hilbert space. And actually, that's the question, to come back to the question you asked before, right? If you take a true interacting system, there is no way you're going to be able to single out a particle, right? It's going to be a mix. And there's n there'll never be a true particle that you're going to be able to pull out of the whole thing, except you can fix a state like this, and, but once you've let it evolve through the operator, it's going to be all mixed, right? So uh, speaking of a single particle is something which is rather difficult. Okay, so, well, now, so this is nice. It's uh, very general and it's very simple, makes it nice also. And let's come now to, uh, well, something where you have an interaction. So of course, I'm not able to give any statement uh, about general operators in this case, but what we're going to do is we're going to, well, I'm, I'll, I'll be doing in the next, uh, well, three hours, not the following ones, right, the ones coming tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I'll be developing two things. First, I'll speak about the special model, um, a special model I'm just going to introduce right now. And then I'll speak about the model which is a true, the, f the special model will not be of Schrodinger type, right? It has some flavor of Schrodinger and some simplifications. And then I'll explain how you can use the intuition gained studying that model, this toy model, to study what actually, what actually happens for a true Schrodinger model. Okay? So the first thing is the toy model. So it's called also, well actually it has two names depending, it was coined in the 70s at almost the same time on both sides of the Iron Curtain and uh, well, because of this, it bears two different names on the two sides of the Iron Curtain. So in, on this side of the Iron Curtain, that doesn't exist anymore, but uh, some of us remember, it's called the Luttinger C model. And on the other side, it's called simpler the pieces model. They, called it, they found it so simple that actually they didn't bear to give the name of someone to it. They just called it the pieces model. So what is it? So that's going to be a model for my one particle system, right? What I'm going to define now is the one particle system. It's simple. What you do is the following thing. You take on R, you take a Poisson process. So let's xk, k being z of omega, be a, be a Poisson process. And uh, while normalizing things, I take intensity one. Okay, 
So I look at my points. And I look at the points falling between minus L over 2, L over 2. Right? Let me take some color chalk here. So I look at the x case between minus L over 2 and L over 2. And at all the x case, I'm going to put directly boundary conditions. Right? So I write this, yeah, also in, I'm going to use purple. So I put directly boundary conditions. What does it mean? It means that I'm going to look at the random model h omega l. Let me put it l here. l is just my interval. Is the direct sum of minus Laplacian uh, on xk xk plus one? So I put a tilde at omega for k going from some random number k zero of omega to some random number k or k minus of omega plus of omega, right? With Dirichlet boundary condition. Right, and of course the x tilde k is xk if xk belongs to uh, minus l over 2, l over 2, right? And it's equal uh, x tilde k is equal to minus l over 2, well, when you guess, right? And uh, it's going to be equal to L over 2 on the other side. Okay, just complete it. You just cut it off here, directly. Okay. So the nice feature of this model is that, of course, it's localized, <laughs> right? It's trivially localized. Actually, it's even worse than that. It has uh, eigenfunctions. It has only eigenfunctions of compact support, almost surely, right? So, of course, we know what the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues are, right? We know that eigenvalues are exactly the number. So let me call these pieces. Uh, let me, I'll use this. Delta k is equal to x tilde k, x tilde k plus 1. Right? Of course, x tilde k and x tilde k plus 1 never meet, Okay, almost surely. And so uh, the eigenvalues are just the pi divided by the length of delta k. Uh, okay, so... <laughs> IK. IK. Yeah, IK. Well, the Laplacian will not come up anywhere. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of, as an analyst, it may be a bold move, but I'm going to get rid of the Laplacian. Okay. So let me keep delta k, otherwise <laughs> I'm going to... I won't remember. Okay, so these. And the associated eigenfunction Uh, associated eigenfunction is going to be just uh, sine of um, okay, x, all right? Uh, well, actually, uh, to be correct, I need to normalize it properly, right? The way I define my intervals. And uh, maybe uh, 1 over square root of 2 coming up somewhere here, right? And uh, maybe I forgot some, uh, yeah, I forgot some. Uh, length of delta k one half, something like this, right? There is the square root of the length uh, if, uh, when I integrate out. Otherwise, it's not normalized properly, but okay. That's fine. So we know everything, okay? So this, this thing, it's not a Schrodinger operator, right? Because it's not minus Laplacian plus potential. But it is perfectly localized. And the one thing it doesn't have that the Schrodinger operator has which is a very important feature, right? Which is actually the feature why Schrodinger operators were invented in the first place, is tunneling. There is no tunneling for such an operator in the sense that no particle can go from here to there, right? These are hard walls. They are perfectly separating. There is tunneling within each interval. It can happen because the intervals can be rather large. But there is no tunneling over the whole length of the interval minus L over 2, L over 2. 
because you have put hard walls, right? Everything is separated. So this is why this thing has compactly supported. So yeah, I forgot, of course, 1 over delta k. I forgot to say that they're compactly supported. OK, they're compactly supported eigenfunctions. So this is, well, this is one of the problems you'll have to, if you want to go to Schrodinger operators, that's one of the problems you'll have to understand, right? How you can build in tunneling again, OK? But uh, how much time do you have? Four, three, four minutes? OK, so this should be enough for if, uh, <laughs> if I find my page again. Yeah, here we are. OK, so let me, well, in the three, four minutes, uh, I'm just going to do one thing. What happens? Uh, uh, maybe to, uh, well, let me just put, the easiest to put some theorems. So look, for this, we can define the H u omega l, sorry, n and l, right? I define, I, I replace my h omega lambda by h omega l, right? And use the same formulas and define this is the n particle with interaction u, okay? And what do I assume over u? Assumption on u, uh, well, I just need one assumption. I assume as before u p non-negative, right? I didn't really use it before, but uh, here because I didn't study anything with u. I assume here I have only pair interactions. I assume that u belongs to some LP for some p larger than one, right? I don't assume it to be compactly supported, but it's... Uh, and I assume one last thing. I define z of x is... Uh, x cube integral from x to plus infinity of u of t dt, right? And I assume that this thing goes to zero when x goes to infinity. So I assume u to decay a little bit faster than x to the minus four, right? So it has long range of, well, it doesn't have compact support, right? It's a little bit better than that. So under these assumptions, what I try to prove <coughs> is the following. Uh, notations are the same as before. So first theorem is that uh, omega almost surely 1 over n e u omega n uh, l tends to some function e u that depends on rho when in the thermodynamic limit rho. And what is the more interesting part is that if I compute, I can give an assumption in expansion of EU rho. The first term is the free ground state, zero energy, plus pi, what is it? Pi square gamma star divided by times rho divided by log rho modulus to the cube, one plus little o of one, where, where what? I need to define gamma star. Gamma star is one minus e to the minus gamma two pi, I think it's a eight pi squared, sorry. 8 pi squared, and I need to be telling you where, and gamma is given by the following proposition. Consider now, uh, let E, two particles with potential U, L, to be the infimum of the spectrum of minus d dx. So this is just a Laplacian in two dimensions, plus u of x minus y, right? On uh, L2 of 0 L tensor exterior, so it's anti-symmetric, so let me write it here, on 
L2 of 0 L, exterior L2 of 0 L. So, okay, so I take two particles in a cube of size L. Right? But of course they are intersymmetric. Then for L large, you have that E to U L is equal 5 pi squared over L squared plus gamma over L cube. 1 plus little o of 1. And this defines the constant gamma. Right? That's the, com the gamma coming in here. It comes, I don't know how to compute it, right? So it depends, of course, on u. This is gamma of u. Right? But it's defined as the second term in the asymptotic. So that's the ground state for two particles, anti-symmetric particles, with the Laplacian alone. Right? And that's the correction term coming from adding a interaction, an interacting potential between the two particles. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Yes, sure. Is the little o is when rho goes to zero? N the little o here is when L goes to infinity in this one. And this one, the little o is when rho goes to zero. Right? That's a little o. Little o of one goes to zero with rho. But here it goes to zero. There's no rho here. It goes to zero when L goes to infinity. So it's not a small, small uh, interaction limit, small density limit. This is a small density limit. This is. Rho is small, right? For this, for this. So one thing I should say is that this one thing, but we'll discuss this tomorrow. This is a size log rho to the minus 2, right? So this is much larger than this, right? You have a rho here. And this thing is to have full power rho here. It's only one of log rho squared, right? OK, thanks very much for your attention. Today. So, for the final proposition, yes. E to U is just the, the eigenvalue or both? What, this? No, no, this one, yeah, exactly. The infimum of the spectrum is the ground state. You take the ground state of this operator. Oh. So, you take this operator on this space, right? You can show that the ground state is unique in this case, right? And so, that's the ground state energy. So, it's the bottom, the lowest eigenvalue for this operator. And this, what you show is that this eigenvalue has an asymptotic expansion when you let the size of the square go to infinity, right? And this asymptotic expansion looks like that, and it defines this constant, gamma of u, right? And this constant gamma of u is what comes in here. And another question is that, uh, just now you, 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 you say something about the, the, this, uh, this gamma k uh, precise zero lambda. Exactly. This oh, is going to, why? sorry? You, you said, there you say something about the, the u equals zero is okay, yeah. right? But how about the u is not, not true okay? Well, time is over today, but it's okay. going to come tomorrow, right? You're going to, you're going to get the results for gamma. Actually, I'm going to give the results for gamma 1 and gamma 2 tomorrow. Right. Uh, this, this, is, this is not just the, uh, the icon function. It's a candle operator, right? This is a trace class operator, exactly. This is a trace class operator. Right? But that incorporates many eigenfunctions. Well, actually, not eigenfunctions. In general, what you have is... It's kind of a projector, right? It's, it's not a projector. In general, it's not a projector. It's something more complicated than that. Yes. Right? But it's, uh, it, it, it is a characterization of this function. But of course, you cannot, you cannot recover in the same way as you do with random variables, you cannot recover this function from a single marginal. Yeah. Right? This is not enough. Yes. You would need to have all of them, right? And to a pretty good precision, meaning that you need how fast this goes there. Okay? But it's going to tell you, this is going to tell you roughly where your particles, the, the, the difficulty here is the following thing. You have a system with n particles, right? Yeah. But the system with n particles you are not able to single out, because the system is interacting, yes. there is no way you can single out a particle. You can, you're not being able to tell you that, well, I picked my particle number k. It doesn't make any sense, right? Because the whole thing in a, in a state like this is all mixed. Yes. Okay? Exactly. But nevertheless, we, what I'm going to do is, 
I'll, I'll give you a result on this, yeah. but I will also do something else, which is really particular to this model. I'll be showing you how the particles are distributed within my pieces, right? In this model, you can do something which is, uh, I come to that, this is part of the proof actually, and this is why this model is interesting. You can actually say that in the ground state, a given piece contains a number of particles. Okay, I'll explain how to do that tomorrow. Okay, so this will complete, actually it is from this description that you get the description of this. The, we chose to give a description of this thing because these are the traditional objects that physicists look at when they are dealing with many particle systems, oh. right? Okay, that's, that's, that's really the, 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 the objects that physicists look at. But they're really exactly the analogs of marginals for probability distributions. So whether it's marginal, it's going to give us a lot of information. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, it's going to give us not all the information, of course. But uh, anyway, th there's one difficulty is that a single particle in such a system, you remember, the total energy of your thing is going to be of order the number of particles. So a single particle anyway weighs very little. There is no way you're going to ever get a description which is precise enough to tell you what a single particle does. You'll only be able to tell what groups, sufficiently large groups of particles are doing. Yes. Right? And I'd be happy if I'd be able to do it with groups that are not of size proportional to the total system size. Right? If I, it, even doing this is very hard. Right, going to little o of n, taking groups of particles which are little o of n, is difficult. Right. Okay. Sure. Okay. Any question? Then we can ask questions during the break. Okay. Thank Thanks you. very much.